Good morning. One of the, my name is Don Kanak, and I'm the chairman of Prudential Corporation uh, Asia. As the moderator of the panel this morning, it's my pleasure to welcome the audience and, of course, all my fellow panelists. We've been uh, talking in the last couple of days, many great debates and discussions and ideas in the East Asia Forum around the question of inclusive and sustainable growth. And today, this morning, we're going to open with a discussion of inclusive and sustainable protection. It's my pleasure to introduce briefly the five panelists who will be discussing this topic this morning. And as you will see, they represent a depth of experience and a very wide perspective on this, on this discussion. First, and directly across from me, and I, for the audience, we'll apologize in advance. Um, um, it's difficult sometimes to tell from where you're sitting who is speaking, but we'll do our best to move around when we're talking so you'll know who's talking. If you're behind, you can still tell who's talking. Um, let me start by uh, introducing the Deputy Prime Minister of Cambodia, Mr. Keith Chan, who is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy and Finance, directly across from me. Um, To the Deputy Prime Minister's left is Mr. Thomas Klotz, the managing partner of Roland Berger Strategy Consultants. Thomas is based in Singapore. <laughs> to Thomas's left, Dr. Supachai Panichpakti, who is Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and he's also a former Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, Dr. Supachai. To my left, Mr. Matthew Driver, who is President Southeast Asia of MasterCard Worldwide and also based in Singapore. And to Matthew's left, Ms. Jeru Bilamoria, Social Entrepreneur, Managing Director of Child and Youth Finance International, which is one of the world's leading movements to ensure financial inclusion and protection for children. The development of inclusive and sustainable social protection systems is not just a subject for East Asia. Um, I think a day, certainly not a week, goes by without a discussion in the West, in developed countries, about the question of whether the social protection systems that have been put in place there are inclusive enough and whether they are sustainable to provide health care, to provide pension coverage at a time when a society is aging and there's fiscal stress and maintain promises and also reach out to underserved populations is causing great angst in a number of developed countries around the world, as you know. Developing East Asia has an opportunity to learn from examples from its neighbors and from the West as to what can be copied and what should be avoided. And during that process, it's possible, I hope, and I think we all believe, to improve on models, to develop new models that are inclusive and sustainable, and to deal with issues such as the inclusion of women, gender equality, and the role of education and financial literacy. We're going to start this morning with each panelist making a brief remark, five minutes. We'll go around, hear from each panelist, answering the question, what are the key gaps and issues that you see in this area? And, and perhaps if you can fit it into three minutes, maybe an opportunity area you'd like to discuss. And then we'll open it up to some discussion, and we really want the audience to participate. So please um, be prepared to make comments and remarks and ask questions. Let me start, please, with the Deputy Prime Minister. If you could open us up with your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is a huge issue. Indeed, the East Asia is a diverse 
consisting of advanced, uh, middle income, and low income economy. Uh, social protection system in East Asia are complex and diverse, reflecting their different conditions. So I will concentrate uh, only on Cambodia, my country. Cambodia's social protection system is a fragmented system. And formal, uh, uh, fragmented system of informal and formal uh, social protection to enable large numbers of beneficiary access to services, food, income, and micro loans. It consists of unconnected program, public work program, and cash transfer can uh, respond well to the seasonal uh, unemployment. It consists of food distribution in time of emergency, and the budget has an airmark budget for disaster relief, school feeding program and scholarship, food for work program addressing food insecurity and seasonal uh, employment, uh, such as building road, railroad and maintenance uh, of irrigation system. Hill equity fund are used to provide health service fee exemption to the population in general identify as poor, and uh, community-based uh, health insurance and micro-health insurance addressing basic health protection and uh, bet, uh, for the better of, of uh, po uh, uh, population. Uh, and a training program to develop skill uh, use, uh, using the special form of uh, prime minister and uh, the challenge uh, we face uh, for in social and gender uh, equity goal is you also. So I, the, I just uh, try to enumerate uh, some key challenges. They are one, most income, most low income economy has high incidence of poverty and unemployment. One, two, low level of coverage of social protection. Three, the need to balance between employment generation and development of social protection mechanism. And uh, four, high malnutrition rate among rural women and children as uh, there are a need to change diet and behavior. Given limited resources, the program should address the social and gender equity. Uh, in particular, the program should target women and children who are probably the most vulnerable, followed by rural poor and jobless. To address the gap in meeting gender equity and social goal, a target cash transfer program, a 45 food distribution, should be launched. Enhancing productivity calls for focusing both young children on those uh, of working age. Study, you know, uh, shows that uh, investing in early childhood nutrition, especially the first thousand days and preschool uh, stimulation can be predictor of uh, a productivity later in the life. And a continuing agenda can link uh, beneficiary and social protection program to other, to other programs that can be, that can activate the, them into the labor market. <coughs> However, an efficient and responsive social safety net system should satisfy the following uh, principle. Appropriativeness, meaning the customized program should be uh, respond to the specific need of the country. Second, adequacy of adequacy, meaning that the system needs to cover all the poor and vulnerable group. Equitability, meaning that the program should provide equal benefit to people with the same 
needs and sustainability uh, should be affordable uh, given uh, current and foreseeable public revenue. And the last one I may uh, add that is adapt adaptability uh, should be able to evolve uh, and remain relevant in face of uh, economic and social change. So I just some idea for the food of salt for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thomas? Yes, um, I took a bit of a broader view across <coughs> Southeast Asia, uh, particularly countries um, uh, like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Philippines, and, and Vietnam. Um, and if we look at the social protection systems there, they, they are, of course, still young and in line with roughly the development of the respective countries. Um, but looking at them, we can probably see around you know, five challenges. You know, one has to do with coverage and participation. One has to do with the level of benefits. Uh, of course, the question of financial sustainability that Don already raised. Um, there is probably an issue around inefficient or efficiency of distribution and administration. And maybe the final one is a linkage between um, handing out benefits and achieving, truly achieving social policy goals. So if you look at, uh, at these five in a bit more, more detail, um, of course, I mean, across all of these nations, um, the major social protection systems on pension and health are very much uh, focused on the formal labor force. And there again, also even there more on the public employees than the private employees in terms of coverage and service. Um, and that leaves out more than 50% uh, of the labor force. Um, in some countries like Indonesia, you have a voluntary participation opportunity, but again, the whole contribution has to be paid by the person themselves uh, rather than a contribution to the employer, which makes the uptake very, very, very small. Um, and uh, of course, all of these major programs are not really tailored to the cash flow patterns of the informal lab labor force, and that makes it all very difficult. On the benefit side, because uh, these countries, a lot of the benefits probably are still insufficient um, and, and maybe even below the poverty line. Um, but more importantly, actually, they're not designed to cover inflation and particularly the issue of longevity. And sorry, it's an issue <laughs> because uh, we're going to see a dramatic aging relative to where these societies are today over the ne next 30 to 40 years. Uh, and that will uh, challenge them in the same way as the Western uh, countries have been challenged. Um, and that will lead to the question of financial sustainability. Uh, right now, uh, I think these countries are in a privileged situation. They have economic growth. They have a young uh, workforce. Uh, but looking ahead, and admittingly looking ahead by a few decades, but still looking ahead, um, there are questions around some defi the defined benefit schemes in, in the Philippines and Vietnam uh, around universal health care and how that is going to be uh, uh, financed in, in, in Thailand and, and Vietnam for that matter. Um, the fourth point, in inefficient distribution and uh, ad administration. Um, of course, the whole challenge of how to bring these services to the rural areas is a major one. I think we're going to talk about that a bit more a bit later. Um, but also that in many of these countries, programs have been developed over time uh, responding to certain needs. And now you have, like Indonesia, eight institutions running more than 20 of such programs. Mm -hmm. And you can already see the administrative efficiency that's going to be involved with that uh, and probably overlaps and probably also gaps. And finally, uh, conditional cash transfer, um, something that... Um, of course, is a very, very uh, controversial topic in the West because of the entitlement attitude. But a country like Brazil, for instance, has a program that links cash transfers to uh, certain conditions around prenatal care, about um, child vaccinations, about school enrollment. And I think it's only fair to say, look, if there is a cash transfer, we want to also achieve certain public sector or public policy objectives that are to the benefit of society overall. 
And that also, I don't think, as much is happening yet here in, in Southeast Asia. So all of these, um, I think, financial inclusion, to come to that point of our topic, will make and can make a significant contribution. Uh, it can contribute to uh, including much more of the informal uh, uh, workforce. It can make a contribution in terms of distribution efficiency. Uh, it hopefully can design better products uh, tailored to, uh, to that workforce. Uh, but I think uh, when uh, the, the governments, the various states, are thinking about their social protection system, they should keep probably three major principles in mind. Uh, one, do not relieve the individual from its responsibility to care for him or herself. Again, I think uh, Western countries have gone much too far in, in that area. Um, uh, secondly, um, use it to achieve certain public sector or public social policy objectives. Uh, and thirdly, of course, have, a, have an eye on the long-term financing. Again, it is easy at this point to design policies that will greatly help in the short term and, and will be very popular. And I think we're seeing in some other parts of the world how that is becoming an issue a bit later on. Thank you. Uh, Th thank you. Uh, I would like to start from the point of United Nations system. At the moment, if we look at one of the three pillars of the UN system, besides human rights, uh, security issue, uh, development issue, the three, I think, topmost uh, issues on the development side would be the green economy, the low carbon development, would be food security, and uh, would be social safety nets. Why? Uh, because we've looked at the past of the Millennium Development Goals. You remember in 2000, countries around the world agreed at the General Assembly in September 2000 to set eight Millennium Development Goals. Out of the eight goals, seven goals are social goals, only one economic goal. Partial success. We're now addressing post-2015 goals, which we agree, meaning the General Assembly agree, that we would call it sust sustainable development goals. So in the sustainable development goals, is included inclusive development that includes total elimination of poverty, not to half poverty by 2015. We have already reached the goal of having poverty, global poverty, before 2000, only in 2010. But now, the next aim for the next, uh, I don't know, 10 years, it will be total elimination of poverty. And to be able to achieve inclusive growth and development. Why? Because growth is becoming something which can be driven by market force, private sectors, international trade. But growth with social protection, with equality, with gender equality, with youth employment and not unemployment, is something which cannot be achieved if one, left, if one would leave all the things to the market alone. You've seen that the emergence of the uh, subprime, subprime mortgage crisis, it was partly explained by the, the, the inequality in the United States system. That's why they had to give away a lot of mortgage, uh, subprime uh, basis, very low quality. You are seeing uh, all the springs around the world, not only in Arab Spring, you are not, you know, seeing springs in Asia, in, in many countries in Asia. And these springs are not going to turn into something which is uh, flourishing. They turn into very long, hot summers. And many countries, most of them are still caught in the spring. We are helping both Egypt and Tunisia at the UN. I'm working closely with the, with, this, with the governments how to turn the spring into something which is going to be a permanent democratic governance movement. We are seeing a lot of protests in front of the Wall Street. Uh, you see the, we are the 1 billion, we are the 99%. So we have actually analyze and prove one thing, that growth without social protection, without equality, cannot be sustained, can only be uneven, unpredictable. So this is where we start from. Now, the difficulty is that, first, we are working with economies around the world, mostly poor economies, that are not always uh, uh, preoccupied with the formal sector. In most countries that deal with poverty, there are countries that have at least 50% of the economy involved in the informal sector. How can you deal with the poverty, social protection in the informal sector? They don't even register themselves. I deal with countries in transition in Eastern Europe. The 
They call transition economies. I don't call them informal economy. They call, they call themselves shadow economy. Many of Central Asian economy, they have shadow economy, 50%. So social protection is not a matter of only poor countries, but of countries that have to cope with formal and informal sector. Secondly, it is difficult because uh, social policies lend itself very much to the sort of populist, uh, populism policies. You would see that on the verge of any election, you would see people coming out. We love all of you. We love you. You know, you have to work for us. We love. We give away everything. So social protection is sort of fly by night, populism-based kind of policy. It's not sustainable. The third one is that uh, there must be the kind of sustainability criteria that are not always met. And I will go through four, three or four of them quickly. The first one. Uh, you have already mentioned, Scott, uh, this is the, the financial sustainability. And most of the time, politicians love to talk about social protection, social safety net. We talked about it at the UN because it is award winning things without even thinking of where they have to find the resources mm. to sustain the programs. Give away cash transfer. You, you ask any politician, they all agree with you. But we have done studies in most countries that have sustainable social safety net programs, at least the government revenue should amount to something like 20% of the GDP. You go, you go around in Asia, most of the average share of government revenue is around 10, 12, 15% at the most. To reach 20%, let alone in the Scandinavian model, they have 30, 40%, which is too high. And of course, that's another problem. <laughs> so fiscal sustainability means also the adequacy of financing and also to prevent the kind of falling over the cliff, like what happens in the, in the Western world, that you have become so indebted that you are not really doing social security. You are making people work harder because in Europe, the only way they can treat excessive indebtedness in the social welfare area is to let people work longer. So retirement age used to be 60, 62, now 64, 65, now close to 70 is in many countries. I'm sure that in the next couple of decades, people will have to work until they are 80 years old because people are getting older. So this is the first thing. We talked about social protection. You have to be sure that you are really protecting them and not protecting them and then turn away and, and tax them later. And Mr. Klaus, you talked also about demographic, demographic dividend or deficit. Aging societies, they have uh, to find a way to pay for them. And so the, the younger generation have to bear the burden. So you have to be careful. Second point, sorry, <laughs> Quick, uh, <laughs> quickly. Uh, to make it sustainable, no free lunch, not even for poor people. Don't give them the wrong, the wrong uh, perception. There must be condition. Most are familiar in Brazil. Family get uh, cash transfer. You have to take your child to school every day. Once a year, the child health must be checked. In India, they have employment guarantee program. In ADB, some of their major investment projects, they, they, they ask you to guarantee employment of gender equality, women. The third one, when you do social protection on a modernized basis, don't destroy the traditional basis. In Asia, we have natural social protection. The churches, the temples, the extended family system, taking care of all ages. We tend to destroy all this when we move ahead. And the last point I want to make is the international community. International community has to be consistent, coherent in a way. They practice give away with one hand, take away with another one. There's no way to do social protection. And social protection at the international level, when we start to do this exercise in SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, I hope that we would correct the past MDG goal, which was so tilted towards only social investment without adequate economic capacity building. So you end up having countries opening up their palms of the hand, asking for donation after donations. In the next couple of decades, there will be no, no more donations. They have to depend on themselves. So the balance between Finding ways to, to have your own revenue to be able to support your own self is crucial, and that must be a coherent policy at the international level. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of cover off, it, I guess, from a, from a payments platform per perspective, um, largely because payments have a key role, um, particularly prepaid and stored value, in, in driving inclusive growth. Studies have shown that economies that, that really adopt payments grow faster, have higher levels of fiscal efficiency, and obviously have lower distribution costs, which is a critical aspect 
of accessing and, and serving uh, the, the most vulnerable communities um, around the world. The, the biggest enemy that we see is really cash. Um, cash costs and is the enemy of inclusion um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's financially expensive for, for any economy. Um, between 0.5% and 1.5% of GDP just to print, secure, distribute cash. But more significantly, perhaps, is the, the social cost of cash because it facilitates um, corruption. It is um, illegal activity, um, tax avoidance, various other components that, that, that drive inefficiency. And that's estimated at something like $16 trillion around the world. So it's, it's a huge issue. So the challenge is how do we, how do we really drive the efficiency with, with electronic payments? And, and we see a number of gaps that are related to existing programs that are around the world. So what I'll do is I'll sort of cover off the, the gaps that we see and then talk about some implementation um, points. Firstly is that the, the one big piece is coordination of policy. Um, mobile is going to be a really key aspect of this. And even in Myanmar just recently, just even yesterday, the banking um, session, a lot of discussion around the intersection of, of mobile and banking. And it's really critically important that you have the integration and, and, and the design of a, of a system that ensures that both mobile banking or mobile services and banking, ICT, are integrated. So you're able to leverage that. That's a critical piece. Another gap is that what I call closed loop programs. So even today where you do have um, mobile systems or they, they tend to be closed loop within the environment of a single provider. And, and that creates a challenge because you need to have the interoperability. If you're going to go from one side or one provider to another, the key is driving the interoperability that, that comes with that. Um, and I think that particularly is, is a challenge. Fragmentation is another point that's been made earlier. Again, mobile is a good, great solution for that. So for me, the, the main message is driving interoperability and, and really focusing on getting cash out of the system. In terms of keys for, for implementing this, I think there are a number of things that are important. One is just driving the right kind of infrastructure development. You, you need the, the efficiency and the, and the structure and the, um, the, the core infrastructure in place. And, and that's a, going to be a critical, important um, perspective here in Myanmar just going through the, the mobile licenses now. And there's a great recognition that, and, and aspiration and hope that that's going to make a, a huge difference. Um, secondly, to the point I made earlier, developing a regulatory framework that makes sense. Um, coordinated regulation, um, but not regulation that really restricts the ability. So you need to balance the, you have to have, to have the elegant design. I think a point was made in our, our earlier session. But at the same time, you're facilitating open competition and encouraging interoperability. Um, third is trying to avoid situations where you're creating you know, a very domestic system. You're seeing a lot of fragmentation. So to the extent to which you can leverage an international standard, take, that, take the efficiencies from an international standard from other markets, and, and drive those core things across, um, a system is going to be very important rather than building an idiosyncratic localized platform. That doesn't mean you can't be customized or adapt to a local environment, but you want to use the international systems that are proven to be secure, and so on that, to, to that extent, you're, you're developing trust with, with these groups of people because you're able to deliver um, secure, safe, efficient, simple, smart um, services. I guess the other piece around this is community engagement, education, how, you, how you're working with those people. Um, critically important aspect, you know, they have to be, feel secure and safe. And I think the, the other real important point is really around um, building networks in the public-private kind of partnerships related to working with NGOs. NGOs have a really critical role. How do we ensure mm. that NGOs are brought into the system? And that's critically important. Thank, Thank you. you. A great transition exactly. to Giroud. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so child and youth finance, we work globally, and I've seen different things, of course, across different geographies. Um, but there's one thread which I've seen which runs across all, is if we want to have a good social protection system, we actually need to start very young. You need to start with, A, 
educating the children in the school systems on all issues related to both financial inclusion related to and related to social protection. If you ch ask a child, even a teenager or an 18-year-old, they're not thinking about insurances. They're not really thinking about pensions. They're not thinking about how the future is going to pan out. Or they're not thinking about what is their responsibility for senior citizens. So I think there's a big gap which is there between those who have to ch technically build the social protection system, the young people, by contributing in and the older people. So as a social entrepreneur, I'm saying what are the solutions? How can we take across an inclusive society, which is A, looking after all people, so what you said, no poverty, B, a society which is sustainable, because currently, even the structures in Europe, we are finding they are not sustainable. So as the entrepreneur, I'd say there are four, uh, four solutions which we can look at, which some of them have been touched upon. I think my first one is a very simple solution. Start young, start teaching children about money, but please don't make it only about money. Mm -hmm. Include social values, citizenship education when you talk about it. So I say when you're talking about children to save, don't just talk about saving money, talk about saving light, water, electricity. So it's a very inclusive way of looking at financial education. So to me, that is the first thing. Second thing is, we have graduation from children in schools, but why not make them graduate with a savings account? Or it can be a pre-K card because that's much easier, but the concept of ownership with something, so children are already entering in a very protected way the financial system. So then you start with a savings account. You link, as they go into their teenage years, the concept of insurance. So you have, through the education system, a gradual transition into the financial system, which is very, very sustainable. So I think that's one thing. That's the second recommendation, which we have found really works. And the third recommendation, I always talk in pillars of three, the third recommendation is when children or enter either the job market or the entrepreneurship market. Uh, you know, they start their own businesses. What is it that they need to have to be sustainable? And when you're 18, you're more interested in partying than thinking about what's going to happen 50 years down. But at the same time, sort of building that in, into the workplace for new entrants, so that they know both what is important for themselves, but also their responsibility for future generations. So I think if you have to look at social protection and inclusion, you have to do it in a very systematic way, starting young, and then hopefully 50 years down, we won't be needing this, because we would have gradually transitioned all systems. And I think East Asia in particular, it's very useful because you all are developing, you know, the region is developing its protection systems. So it can really learn from it in a systematic way and leapfrog. And that's what I think is the wonderful thing about having this now. So thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a great introduction. I think the audience also can, can appreciate the diversity of perspectives here and also just how complicated this, these issues are. And that as governments tend to be organized uh, in silos, um, but these issues of aging, the issue of social protection, really cuts across various uh, ministries in a government. So the question of coordination, I think, is, is one that kind of jumps out. Another one that jumps out to me from this discussion is, is I will call it um, the, the, the issue of informal versus formal, okay? And, and as governments are trying to create more formal systems, the risk that comes to the destruction or the undermining of the informal system. And I'm just wondering, get some perspectives and maybe your experiences uh, as, as a panel of, uh, do you see uh, good examples and solutions in certain places where governments are formally supporting the informal systems? Or is the very nature of, of rule of law and protection of equal rights, in a sense, become take the values and the informal system out of play, that supporting a temple in a local area as a, man, may have a way of dealing for social protection might, in fact, 
infringe on the question of religious liberty? How, how do you see those issues being balanced, and where do you see good examples of, of, of success in that area? Maybe I'll start uh, first with Dr. Supachai. There are a few things, uh, Don. Um, first, uh, governments should not be trying to formalize the informal sector. You see, because we've been working with the so-called creative economy around the world. And creative economy means people working with their hands, with their heads, uh, computers. It's created by, by your own uh, brains, writers, uh, songwriters, singers, entertainment. These are people working mostly in the informal system. To, to, this is the, the, big, the, the, the upper layer, because the lower layer, the really poor people, the vendors. But these are the people with whom we've been working with and with whom we've been trying to introduce some way of giving them certain protection. Right. You see, so it's not telling them to register themselves with the government, but we go in and we talk to their people, their associations, see how we can channel government uh, policies in terms of giving them the same kind of treatment for old age, for protection against unemployment and things like that. This is one area. This is more or less what I call the upper layer of informal sector. Another one is like what uh, Jedu just said, is about uh, teaching children how to be parsimonious and things like that. I, I would like to cite the things that our own His Majesty the King has been actually advocating in the last, uh, I don't know, 30, 50 years, which is called sufficiency economic. Sufficiency economic. It's not self-sufficiency. It's sufficiency economic. It means moderation with everything you do. So this is the kind of thing that if you introduce this into the informal sector, particularly in cases of a country predominated by farming sectors, you can have farmers trying to do things. Uh, they can fish, they can plant some rice, they can plant some plants, they can do some non-farm uh, things, but do it with moderation and don't be over hasty in committing themselves to big projects or all borrowing without knowing what is happening. So that's two sides of the thing. Try to make it sure that the inroads of formal treatment goes through the informal channels and try to incend the, cell, the sense of uh, having the right attitude uh, in approaching economic uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Can you do yeah. maybe comment from your side about the how informal systems, if you've got examples? Yeah, of uh, what we have seen is actually when you work through the school system or through community centers, it is very, very powerful because for a bank or to take, to open a savings account with each individual or to even get a card or whatever, with each individual, there's a very high acquisition cost because you're doing it individual to individual. Uh, however, if we look at community systems, community centers, um, to go to a school and then teach the children and then open savings accounts, A, transaction co uh, acquisition costs are low, transaction costs are low. So financially, it makes a lot of sense. And at the same time, you're building on an existing system. What we have found, when I will say from my experiences in India, we started teaching financial education in very remote rural schools where there were no banks. And we started with the children, where the children started saving money. Parents who had never saved money, actually the mothers especially, started giving the children money. So the school was like, how can a child have so much money? And they were like, no, 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 my mother said, why don't you keep it? It's safer in the school than at home. So then the money started coming, you know, from the home to the schools. And because of that, then the schools started linking them to formal banks. And then because there were so many accounts, banks were willing to come to the school to transact business. So just a very informal way in a very rural area built the financial economy through the school with a very small program. And I think this is something which we need to be looking at and building on, and not, especially in East Asia, not doing away with the informal systems and the family and the community which exists. So I think that's something we need to look at in a lot of models. Do you have a, any comment on that, Matthew? Well, I, I think the only point that I would make is that the, the success of microfinance has been based on community. And I think so it's not so much a question of, of either or, it's how do you put those things together? How do you ensure that you've got a low cost delivery system there that can respect the, the local community structures, but also deliver access to other services to, to, to bring people up and encourage um, positive behavior? I mean, 
if I may. I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful actually this topic of uh, informal uh, social protection has come up because, again, if I look at the Western world, uh, let's talk about the core of informal networks, which is the family, mm. exactly. the immediate family. And I think over the last few decades, we've seen a deterioration of the family and family values in the Western societies where the caring for the parents and elderly people, the caring for uh, you know, uh, sick people has been increasingly take, been taken over by the state and uh, away from the family. Um, uh, and there have been other developments around uh, broken up families and an end. And I do think that governments as the leaders of society have to, as, a, as, as the directors of the society, elected direct, electors of society, have to think about whether they are going to tolerate these developments or whether they even in, encourage them with providing maybe too much support versus finding ways to provide the right level of support while maintaining, I think, a social concept that has served humanity very well for centuries. And I think that's the biggest one of the biggest fears probably I have was, yes, let's expand social protection in the right way, but let's not go overboard. So, so you're, I mean, what I think is emerging so far in this discussion, and it'd be interesting to get audience reaction in just a minute, but I'd like to uh, maybe ask the Deputy Prime Minister. We're talking about the, the idea that values are very important. Values that reinforce family, that reinforce community, that reinforce education, and the, uh, several of you have mentioned the issue of conditionality, that in order to be eligible for certain payments, that behavior that represents mm -hmm. those values should be demonstrated. That is, that's a, I'd have to say, though this far in this discussion, a concept that I think we don't often hear in the West. Right. Governments tend to try to sometimes stand aside from Step, stay, stepping into the values question. But here in this panel, it's coming out as a very important mm. aspect of getting a sustainable, inclusive, productive so, social protection system. Um, as the government uh, official on this panel, how do you feel in that regard about values being part of the policy to reinforce those traditional values? Um, I, uh, in case of Cambodia, I uh, spoke about our fragmented uh, social protection and uh, government cannot do everything uh, and uh, we have to have partnership to build partnership with the uh, private sector and with individual uh, also so uh, we have to do two idea first uh, we have to shift from the fragmentation system to fragmentation to system. Systematize, systemize the system itself. And also, uh, like you put it, uh, move from exclusion to inclusion. That is the theme of our discussion. So uh, we have a, at present a government work with business to complement each other in order to establish a formal social protection program by adopting uh, the approach I told you first, uh, shifting from fragmentation to system. Uh, in order to respond to future economic crisis and uh, climate change, a system-oriented approach to social protection program should be strengthened and coordination should strengthen coordination and uh, integration. We have established the fund managed by public sector, meaning we have a, to have a uh, fiscal space to, for that. Uh, first, uh, national security fund, national so social security fund cover employment injury and uh, occupational disease, including provisional for medical services, funeral costs, survivor functions. Some 100,000 uh, workers are covered with 80% from government industry. Uh, 
uh, both government and employee, employer, government and employer contribute to this fund. Two, uh, national security, a fund for civil servant, about uh, one, uh, roughly two, nearly 200,000. The so civil servant are covered also with their family and this fund by government budget. A national Fund for Veteran also, and a National Disability Fund. So uh, we try to build this uh, system uh, in the uh, uh, right way. Uh, secondly, uh, we have to move from exclusion to inclusion. The social system managed by the private sector includes the following. Health insurance and workman compensation program provided by private general insurance company, so insurance industry. Life uh, insurance product offered by life insurance company, uh, like uh, we have three big operator, uh, financial, uh, Manu Life, and, uh, and also uh, Cambodian Life, uh, which joint venture with uh, our uh, regional partner. And uh, another point is about microfinance, micro insurance, and micro life insurance product offered by private provider throughout microfinance institution and uh, micro life uh, insurance institution uh, to pay on behalf of the borrower. Uh, in case of that, say now, uh, like uh, the day before uh, yesterday, uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, now microfinance cover 1.6 million of uh, household and uh, the micro life insurance, and uh, now they are only at their uh, 20,000 uh, customer household, but they aim at 1 million uh, household. And you, we speak also about uh, the innovation and technology. Uh, innovation, we have introduced the link uh, between social protection to microfinance in form of interest insurance, like I told you, and the micro uh, insurance product offered by private the provider, private provider throughout microfinance institution to pay, uh, or, or I repeat, uh, on behalf of borrower in case of debt. But uh, also the technology solution. Yes, uh, now this uh, on vogue about the. Uh, cash payment by phone, but uh, experience in our country uh, shows that you need also physical presence of the, say, microfinance operator itself, in all the case of Cambodia. Thank you. Could, yes. could, I, could, I, yes, please. could I add two, two examples from two countries mm. in terms of having governments uh, trying to cultivate the value system? The one example that we've been working with is in Ethiopia. Uh, you know, government of Ethiopia is very forward-looking, but so sad that the former prime minister passed away so soon. Uh, but he actually instigated uh, the first construction of hydroelectric dam by not using at all external borrowings. He was offered loans from World Bank and from external sources, but he actually flowed domestic bonds mobilizing uh, from savings of the Ethiopians. And they organized throughout the schools, throughout the whole country of Ethiopia, that children pool their small, small savings together so that uh, about 10, 20 can buy one bond. And this is a national, you know, it's a, it sounds very nationalistic, but it's, it creates a kind of value that the children love the hydropower dams, mm -hmm. and they love to have the ownership, to have the savings, to help the, 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 the public sector. So this is one very good example I like very much. Uh, the second one is in, uh, is in uh, Bhutan. You know, the, uh, the Bhutanese government, uh, majest His Majesty the King, uh, they have this movement called the Growth uh, Happiness Index. 
which seems something so strange for economists. But I like the idea, not because of it doesn't have much of, for me, economic sense. But it has the right sense of instilling the sense of value to the people that you don't go for, you don't go for cash growth. You, know, you don't just go for, for finance alone. You go for happiness. And they try to, to survey, have stakeholders meeting, to survey what is it that, that gives the kind of uh, uh, happiness indications for the family. Is it the, the, the big family taking care of old people, mm. living together, uh, having community uh, uh, activities, things like that. So these are two examples. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I, well, in the principle of happiness, a happy audience is a good audience. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's nice. a good time now Great. to um, yeah. introduce the uh, audience to the floor. And if uh, anybody has questions, if you have comments, please keep them brief, but try to put something in the form of a question. I just ask that you raise your hand. When you speak, please identify yourself and your organization, where you're from. So I saw two hands on this side. Um, please go ahead, Eduardo. Thank you. My name is Eduardo Klein. I work with HelpAge International. Um, I, I think Kun Supachai said it very clearly. Without social protection, there is no sustainable growth. But history also shows, and I'm an economic historian, uh, without social protection, there is no economic growth. So one goes with the other. And uh, just one comment. In Great Britain, right after the war, the, the war, Winston Churchill was at the peak of its popularity. Mm -hmm. But then came Lord Beveridge, and uh, he, he put forth the fourth squalos, the fourth uh, maladies of the British society, which were hunger, lack of health, the lack of housing, and all that. And they developed a social, a comprehensive social protection system. Mm -hmm. And uh, Churchill, with all the peak of its popularity, lost elections because what was needed at that time was uh, the national health system that uh, NHS that was born at that time. And this still may be questioned, but it is, it is there. What happened then? There was a generation that increased, life expectancy increased. Health levels increased, productivity increased dramatically in Britain in those years. So, and that was largely result of that. So, if we say, my question to you is, uh, do you think that in Asian countries or in Myanmar in particular, and there is nobody from Myanmar in the panel, but Myanmar has the opportunity to, and the challenge to balance its investment, but to invest in people through a a comprehensive social protection system, it would have to have a very thorough design mm -hmm. so as to avoid a, a mischanneling resources, but at the same time build the capacities with the child allowances, old age allowances. Myanmar is a very particular country. Only 8% of people who reach old age have formal pension. So you need to establish some sort of guarantee in old age, guarantee for children. So uh, I would say that the, the, the key dimensions of uh, investment in social protection don't, uh, don't, uh, don't overdo it, don't uh, create uh, you know, a wrong mentality in people. Those do not fix here. Here you need desperately a system of social protection with the mindset of future development. Thank you. Thank you. Eduardo, I have another hand in the back here. In relation to his uh, comment and question, uh, two points quickly. Could you identify yes. yourself, please? I, uh, uh, from, I'm from the uh, International Confederation, uh, Trade Union Confederation, Asia Pacific. We represent uh, 56 unions in this region, including uh, Cambodia and Myanmar here. Now, uh, uh, one point, uh, first point, informal economy. Our experience uh, in India, we have three organizations there, and one organization is purely for informal economy, women. They are supporting the micro uh, home-based workers. Membership is 1.4 million. The other one, two organizations, have uh, reportedly organized, waiting for verification, more than 20 million. How they are doing is uh, to support the uh, peace rate, uh, peace rate, 
with the employers through the branches of organizations. And the other one is the, to provide information, provide the informal workers with information about the governmental schemes, connecting the informal economy to the uh, governmental scheme. But this is only possible where the government has a good scheme or some sort of social protection. Okay. Second point is the social protection is very important to redress the inequality. The, in one country, the current GD index is 0 0.37, but without adequate social safety nets and taxation, that figure would rise to 0 0.53. This is significant. Now, Dr. Spachai told us the difference between Europe and, Japan, uh, and the uh, Asia. According to the ILO, I remember, the average figure of GDP spent on social safety net in EU is 25%, but in this region, 5% only. This is a great challenge. And I want to ask brother, uh, Mr. Spachai, how we can make a breakthrough, how we can convince the social partners and government. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to start with that, uh, Dr. Spachai? I think I have actually alluded to the necessity to do sort of fiscal reform, mm. tax policy reform. Mm. Because not only reform to be more efficient in the way taxes are being collected, but also reforms to make taxes more progressive. This is a very favorite topic with my fellow economists, but it's never being practiced by, by, by politicians. <laughs> I have been a <laughs> politician, politician in my life for 15 years, and we try and try to talk about land taxation, taxation on assets must be increased. Mm. Taxation on assets, financial assets must be increased, but it's never done. But I keep proposing this, and, and this is one way out that uh, I, I would see. Uh, uh, just to respond to a uh, gentleman's uh, 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 question on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the exact question, uh, but uh, was it one? The scarcity of uh, pensions, for example. So can I just, uh, you, have, you have two sides of the same question. Uh, Ricardo's asking, can you afford not to have social protection? And then the question you were about to raise, uh, that was raised earlier, is how, do, how can countries afford or how can they raise the percentage the one was, on social protection? The one was uh, fiscal reform. The other, the other one, and you actually target at Myanmar. Myanmar cannot afford to go through even the very basic requirements in, in Asia, which is very minimum already. But the first thing that Myanmar will have to do is to try to have universal secondary education. Secondary education, vocational training, universal. That is not expensive. And secondly, coverage of uh, retirement benefits. Very necessary and not, not very expensive. So these two first for social protection for Myanmar, for me. We have a, a gentleman here. Thank you here. very much. Did I go I'm Professor Miao, previous medical doctor, now a parliamentarian. Because I want to congratulate all the non speakers for their different perspectives that enrich my knowledge. That is first point. Second point is Mima is doing everything what all the London speaker has mentioned, but we need to uh, improve and uh, expand our activities. That I would like to say that now the, the world has moved from previous economic paradigm to green sustainable development, which consisting of sustainable development, plus poverty reduction, ecological, economic, cultural, and political dimensions. That is the first concept we have to make, and our people should have. So second point is, third point is, for security, many people think insurance and other things. 
because it is a lifespan approach, and the London speaker has customized or specific for age group. As a doctor, I said, all women, uh, pregnant women especially, or unmarried women, uh, they are nutritionally deficient. Food security as a household level is important. Yesterday I discussed about the nation of food security and things. Household food security, because they, have no, they are eating food, but nutritious, not nutritious. So the macronutrition macro and micronutrition, that is first point, and security. Now how about the uh, rural people, 70%, Mostly women, they are, if they are weak and anemic, what sort of baby they are going to produce? Low birth weight. As the London speaker has mentioned about the maternal child, mortality is dependent on nutrition, that is first one. And their access to the good quality health care during their pregnancy and delivery. That is for another security measure. We are embarking on that, but we don't have much resources. That is the first one. Another is the health security. In, apart from the uh, maternal and safe delivery things, essential, good quality, primary health care is the most important thing in our country. And access to generic medicine is another thing. And even HIV not about 5% uh, of the people fighting HIV, they are receiving things. But whereas in other countries, more than 25%. And the UN is doing great work for that achievement. That is the first point. Security is concerned with. Security. Education security means we are embarking on the primary education. But the thing is, we should not stop at the free prime compulsory education at the primary level. Because for their livelihood, they have to proceed further secondary education and vocational training, skill development is very important for our country and the international community or our, um, I will finish, thank you. Then. And then, employment, because I am the chairman of the Women's and Children Affairs Committee, mm -hmm. employment. Most of the women are working in the rural, but they are underpaid. And the young people, we are poor. Well, ADV declared that this is not due to unemployment, but due to lowly paid job. That is how to do that. And then, I, want to, I don't want to discuss about, but you are looking at me. So prepaid, social security scheme, community-based insurance scheme. Private is for profit, so that when we are developed, the private insurance will come. But we have to develop community-based insurance scheme, like for informal sector, you had mentioned that. That is a voluntary or something. I think uh, the we, OP. I thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank, I will stop here. No, thank but, you. Well, but thank you very much. It's important we have a perspective from, from Myanmar, and that's that very, is, very valuable. Is thank you. So I take the floor. Thank you. We have any other? Um, okay, one question here. I'm going to take two questions and then we'll respond. Uh, I'm going to do three, but make it, can you make it very brief because brief. we're running close <laughs> to the end here. So one, two, three, and those will be the last questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Runa Khan. I'm from an organization called Friendship from Bangladesh. Um, I deal with the most poorest people in Bangladesh, which are the mobile communities of the rivers and the, and the coastal belts. And there is an aspect which you said that you do think of uh, charity as not being important anymore. But you know the difference between that one five dollars a day, mm -hmm. which is the bottom line, you know, the poverty bracket, and 0.25 dollars a day is really a difference between life and death. Mm -hmm. And for people of that area, you know, 0.25 dollars a day, you need to give them something more than just you need to give them the freebies and the charities to be able to put them up because they are going, they are growing. And they are growing because even the UN doesn't, is not recognizing them as being different from the $1.25, which are rich compared to the $0.25. Okay. Secondly, one, little point. the government themselves are often making 
projects and programs which are only geared to the average of a nation and the country. So you're saying not to include the informal sectors. The informal sectors are dealing with those which are getting left behind, not within the average. So I think there's some amount which needs to be, they need to be addressed and recognized also. Thank you. I don't, I think it might have been misunderstood. I think it was uh, that, um, that uh, Kun Supachai was exactly agreeing with you that the <laughs> informal is critical and needs to be supported exactly. fully. And so you're, you're violently agreeing. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, Timothy Ma from Hong Kong. I would like to share a case that uh, I think to encourage and not deal with the social protection issues, particularly for the cross-generation poverty, we have a project called Public, Private, and Family. There's, uh, the children are encouraged to save up their money, even they are very poor. And then the business sector is going to match the amount that they have. Mm. And then the government is also giving the incentive. So it's a tripartite partnership, but not only the poor family, but also the business sector and also the government. So I think it's a concerted effort to deal with the cross-generation poverty. Yes, thank you. Very good, thank you. From Hong Kong. One more. Yeah, um, John Davies from Intel. I run the uh, Global um, Digital Divide Education and other programs at Intel. And Giroud, I really enjoyed your comments about the community and the lower cost ways of delivering services to the poor people. It reminded me of a program in India, and I have a question on this, um, where about five years ago I was involved with the government and they were putting community centers in villages Maybe they have two computers or four computers, and we ended up involved with the training of the people. And I went back to see some of these, and what you'd see is the services were being provided by people that could never really own technology, but could benefit from it. You would see training. And ladies would come to me and say, I got trained and I got a job in the mall, one registered because I learned some IT skills. Or um, there'd be people that would come back and say, I learned, could you access these government services because I could use this computer for a couple of minutes and this person trained me. And the one that really um, surprised me, and I think it relates to um, yourself and certainly probably MasterCard as well in the audience, was when they showed me, look, a $10 microloan processing um, can often cost $5 to be processed in a central bank, but we do it locally for pennies and we're the agents of the bank in the village. And I think then government drove this but the ladies were then making $100, $150 a month. They were very happy. They wanted more. And I think that program scaled up somewhat in India. Last time I tracked it, it was more like 100,000 female entrepreneurs. Now, um, is that the kind of program that exists in Southeast Asia? Or can it be made to work in Southeast Asia? Because I just thought it was a brilliant program of meeting many of the goals that a lot of you spoke about today. Are you familiar with that program? No, I or know the program, like but I don't know whether it exists in Southeast uh, Asia. Well, do you think from what you know, I mean, that it yeah, might definitely. be worth studying? Yeah, I, I think it's something which can be done because basically through computer education, and it's also one of the most important, if you say, what do you want to learn in a, either a slum community or a rural community? It's English and computers. That's what most people say as the standard response. So if you have something which sort of links to that, it is very remunerative. What hasn't been added is many farmers also learned computers and knew where to be able to sell their products. So they got a higher amount of money from uh, you know, middlemen, et cetera. So I do think if you link it to a community center or a school, you are able to take it uh, to a much larger area. And that's something, that's the reason why school-based education is something we can do. Thank you. Well, we've come to that time of the, uh, of the event um, where uh, we have the most challenging assignment, which is for each panelist in one sentence to summarize <laughs> the most meaningful point that you take away from this discussion, something that surprised you or a, a lesson learned in one sentence. So I'd like to start with Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, I agree with the all uh, idea who set, uh, put forward here. Uh, but uh, I see that there is no uh, one size fit all solution. This is, uh, so we have to work uh, accordingly to the reality of each country. Thank you. 
Thomas? Uh, I will use a German sentence, which can be as long as an entire page. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. You have one sentence from whatever I culture know. you choose. No, it was said um, social protection uh, requires economic growth, and economic growth requires social protection. If indeed that relationship is that critical, I think governments need to get much more um, proactive in designing the appropriate social protection policy. And I am not sure the right organizational models are in place because it is such a comprehensive topic involves job and employment, social protection, uh, health, youth and family, MOF and <laughs> Ministry of Finance, uh, Central Bank. And I just doubt that the kind of level of integrated perspective mm -hmm is existing today across all these government ministries in any country. And I think that's an organizational solution that has to be put in place to enable that kind of strategy and planning that has to happen. Thank you. Uh, it, has, it, it has been a, a long-standing wish of mine to see that in Asia, we adopt national social safety net or protection as a national policy that is not based on partisan interests, that is not based on fly-by-night populism policies, and it must be sustainable in a way that uh, the revenue support uh, could be explained and understood by the people. Mm. Thank you. Matthew? Well, I'd say that the key for me is community engagement and government coordination. I think that the government has to lead. I think that's critically important. Um, we're seeing governments around the world do this um, with, with Nigeria, with some of the examples that have been used. Um, India, the Philippines has a great contingent program um, already in place, um, which is taking advantage of you know, establishing policies, being very focused on community level delivery, but also utilizing technology, which particularly mobile, particularly ICT, um, payments, etc., to, to deal with the economics of delivery to, to these customers. So to me, it's that, it's that integration which is key. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's for me reinforcing a belief that if you have to have social protection and integration, we need a multi-stakeholder approach. And the policies we develop also have to be ensuring we look at all different target groups. And of course, I say what I always say, start young so you're able to shape a generation and a future. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. Well, we've, uh, we've covered a lot in a short period of time. Um, and I think if, if you walk away from this exercise seeing a lot of opportunity, that's terrific. If you see a lot of com complexity, you're a realist. Um, <laughs> the, I think the important thoughts, which were well summarized here, you know, boil down to a few things, one of which is you can't divorce the underlying uh, economy, jobs, health, nutrition, water, sanitation, the basic aspects we sometimes don't think of as part of social protection, you can't separate that from protection because that provides a foundation. That values matter. We, talked, we heard conditionality. We heard re reinforce self-responsibility, reinforce family, reinforce community, that even though governments have formal programs, those informal systems, including NGOs and charity, we should be reinforcing informal systems. So, Confidence to have values matter. We heard technology is a big part of the solution, and it cash, I'm sorry, that cash is the enemy of inclusion, and perhaps mobile cash or mobile value and the, the introduction of accounts at an early age, that can actually be a tremendous breakthrough and a leapfrog. And finally, we heard think ahead, that promising benefits today <laughs> and delivering benefits tomorrow are not the same thing. And, and uh, tax policies and fiscal policies and good planning matter. So I, I think it's been a terrific discussion. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the audience also for adding a lot of uh, great ideas and good questions. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.